If I were to ask you, what is your identity as a Christian? How do you view yourself? I would imagine I would get some answers like, a child of God. It might be the most popular answer, or bride of Christ. And these are wonderful things because it speaks of our belovedness in Christ, which is amazing. Or the scriptures also say we are joint heirs with Christ, which is also really incredible. Like, we're really going to be receiving an inheritance alongside Jesus. And that is our standing in the kingdom. But today, I wanted to get at two of the most foundational understanding of what a Christian truly is. And so if we could have the, the title page, please. First of all, it may be obvious, but we are a forgiven people. And that is a good news, that there is so much freedom, that there is so much joy, there is so much love, understanding that we have been forgiven of all things. So we become Christians, right, through repentance and forgiveness. So forgiveness should not be foreign to us whatsoever. It should be the very culture of Christianity. It should be the very core identity that is expressed in our communal lives. And because we have freely received forgiveness, we are supposed to freely give it out to others as well. But some of us, we celebrate how God's mercies are new for me every morning, but then we can't extend that mercy to other people. How does that make any sense? You know why we should forgive other people? First of all, lest we start to think we're better than anyone else, let me say this. The very forgiveness we give out to others is that same forgiveness you desperately need for yourself as well. But secondly, they say unforgiveness is like drinking poison for yourself and expecting the other person to die. I've seen that unforgiveness is the number one way that the enemy attacks us and binds us from really living out what God has in store for our lives. So, we're going to turn to a story that may be familiar to some of you, and we're going to read this, and, and let's alternate. The parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered, ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servant saw what had taken place... They were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And all of us together, so, so also, also my, my Heavenly Father, Father will, do will do to every one of you if you do, you do not forgive your brother from, from your heart. heart. I think this story loses its impact for us because we don't know about this denarii and talents business. So let me try to put that into our language, our dollars and cents, okay? So one denarius was the wage for a day laborer, okay, for one day. So let's just say $100, okay? A day laborer, you know, makes slightly more than minimum wage of $100. So then this guy owed this other person 100 denarii, which would be like $10,000, okay? For most of us, that's a lot of money. 
It's not something that we can overlook so easily. It feels like a lot. Now, what a talent was, was a talent was how much a day laborer would make in 20 years, okay? So let's just do simple math, okay? So you made $100 a day. Let's say you work 300 days in a given year. That's $30,000, okay? And 20 talents, or, or one talent, $30,000 per year, but over 20 years, that's $600,000, okay? But he didn't owe the king one talent, he owed the king 10,000 talents, which so it's like $600,000 times 10,000, it comes out to $6 billion, okay? So basically this guy, that's how the, see, that's how the listeners would have understood this story back in those times. 10,000 talents, like if you owed someone $6 billion, would you even try to pay back? I don't think I would. I mean, there's only a handful of people who could do that. Like, I mean, if I owe someone 6000 or even 60000 maybe I could wait to get another job and budget and so forth. But, like, this guy literally owes the king $6 billion. So there's no explanation needed. It just simply says because he couldn't pay it, okay, he was going to be thrown into prison because that's what you were able to do back in those days. If someone owed you a, a sum of money, you could actually send them into prison until they worked enough to pay it back. So this guy gets forgiven of $6 billion, and then he's on his way home, and he finds the guy who owes him 10000 and he's like, hey, pay me back, and this guy's like, please have, you know, have mercy on him, we know the story, and he's like, no, and he has him thrown into prison. Other servants see this, and they're like, oh, something's so wrong, they tell the king, and the king's like, you know what, you're going to be thrown into prison, and you won't get out until you pay every last penny, and then the last verse 35 says... That's how your father will treat you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. You know, when someone owes us $10,000, it looks like a lot. Or $10,000 worth of hurt or whatever they cause when people wrong us worth $10,000. Like, it feels like a lot. Like, I, I don't know if someone literally owed me $10,000. I don't think I could like easily overlook that. I want the payment. I will choke him until he's blue, okay? Pay me back. And when someone wrongs us that way and we get wounded and hurt and it's like we feel like it's impossible to forgive them because they've so wronged me, $10,000 worth. But all along, God is telling us, well, you've been forgiven of $6 billion. See, we forget that. Like, as Christians, remember, what if we reminded ourselves, I'm a forgiven person? But I do understand, because when someone hurts us or wrongs us $10,000 worth, it's hard. Some of these wounds that we have, they run deep. And some of us, maybe we want to forgive, but we keep finding that we just can't. You know, over the past, I don't know, decade plus of my life, uh, there was this one uh, person I was angry at more than any other, and it was actually a really close friend of mine from college, and I felt like he betrayed me in, in a really bad way, and I was so angry at him. I was beyond, like, I just, you know, he lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and I just wanted to just slap him, you know? I would daydream in my anger, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, if he was in California, I would just slap him, you know? I wouldn't even punch him. I would just make it that much more demeaning by slapping him. You know, like, I, I would daydream about this and like, and, but you know, I knew that I had to come before God because I knew that forgiveness was not optional. Let's go to the next slide. And that's something that I feel like some people in the church, they're not really grasping. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, we usually cut it off at verse 13, and then we say, for thine is the glory, power, and so forth. But notice what this verse says. I took out a few verses, just wanted to make my point. This then is how you should pray, and it says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So even in that prayer, we don't even presume to ask God to forgive us unless we have already given, forgiven other people first, right? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then Jesus says this, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. 
I think this should be a, maybe a chilling reminder for some of us that really God will not forgive your sins unless you forgive others. Once again, because you're that guy who just turned around from being forgiven $6 billion and he's saying, you know what, you can let that $10,000 go. So because I knew this, even though in my heart I definitely didn't want to forgive him, I came before God. I, I, I wish I could just forgive him, but I was so angry. I was so upset. And I would pray, God, like, give me strength to forgive him because in my heart I don't think I can. And, you know, I can share this from personal testimony. Every time I've had difficulty forgiving someone in my life, and I asked, came before God and said, God, give me strength to forgive that person. He has answered that prayer for me every single time. And I truly believe that that is what God will do. That some of your wounds may run deep, and I don't want to minimize that. But if you come before God and ask Him to give you the strength to forgive your mom, your dad, your friend, your sibling, whomever. You know, the Bible tells us to love your enemies. Sometimes our enemies, actually, usually the, our enemies are not people far off, but the one closest to us. Sometimes our enemy is our spouse, right? Isn't that right? Or our parents, our friends, our children, whomever it may be. But I wanted to encourage you to pray that prayer if you need, because, again, don't drink that poison. Don't drink that poison. And again, God's word is simple, but very direct. If you don't forgive others their sins, my Father will also not forgive you. And so I wrestled with that prayer. I was like, God, please help me to forgive him. And that was the hardest forgiveness thing in my life, and it took me a year of prayer. But God really set me free from that. And you know what God started to uh, tell me to do is to uh, bless him every day. Pray for him. Because in the scriptures, that's what it says, right? It says to bless those who curse you and pray for those who persecute you, right? To pray for your enemies, to love your enemies. And so every day I would bless him. I would bless his family. I would pray for him. I would just do this constantly. And then I realized at some point that my heart was really free. So about three and a half years ago, I actually got invited to speak uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, and where he lives. And so I called him up, and I said, hey, let's hang out and so forth. And long story short, I mean, he actually was visiting his parents for Christmas in Wisconsin, which is his home state. And so I didn't actually get to see him, but in my heart, I had nothing but love for him. And I really wanted to see him, and I was bummed out. And I knew, of course, that I had been totally set free. So I, 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 I want to also implore this to some of us, like, we say, oh, yeah, you know what, I forgave him or I forgave her, but I keep my distance. Or like, it doesn't mean we have to be best friends anymore and so forth. And uh, when we have that, I want to ask you to really evaluate if your forgiveness is genuine. Because when there is true forgiveness, true restoration happens. Just like in our relationship with God. If we say we forgave them, but we still act like, you know, there's, there's an issue or so forth, Again, perhaps you may need to take that before God, and I'll give you an opportunity to pray that even after this message today. And I also want to say this. It may not be best to go up to someone that you have conflict with and say, hey, I forgave you. They're going to be like, you forgave me, right? And then they're going to think the other way. And so um, examine if there's anything that you need to ask forgiveness for if you're a pro tap person. See, asking for forgiveness, not just forgiving others, but asking others for forgiveness, that should also be part of the very fabric and culture of who we are as Christians. Because that's how, again, we became Christians. We asked God for forgiveness, and then we received it. So, when it came to dealing with that friend of mine, I was so upset and whatnot, and I was trying to process this with God, and uh, I emailed him one time just letting him know that I didn't appreciate what he did. And he actually got offended by that email. 
And then a couple of months later, he sends me an email and says, hey, I forgave you. And then I was just like, oh my gosh, now I'm going to slap him twice, you know, like, Ugh, you know, something. I thought I was making progress in forgiveness. That email just totally ruined it, like step one, I'm like, Ugh, you know. And I took it before God. And I was like, God, this guy's so ridiculous. Like, he got offended by that email. It wasn't even that bad, blah, blah, blah. I didn't say really anything bad. I just said I didn't appreciate his conduct, blah, blah, you know, and so forth. And, um, and God spoke to me during that prayer. He said, instead of having him tell you that he forgave you, why didn't you ask for his forgiveness first? <laughs> My first thought was like, God, What? Me asking him, like, you know, like, usually when God speaks to me, like, I, like, usually have a heart to receive, but, like, I was like, no, God, God like, you're crazy. And I said, I protested. If anyone did anything wrong, he did 99%, I did 1%. Like, if I did something wrong, it's 1%. It, God, it's not even 10 versus 90. It's not even close. It's 1. And the Lord gave me a word right away again. Then you apologize for that 1%. And I was like, God, I'll do anything for you but that. Like, why? Because you're responsible to me for that 1%. So out of all my natural inclinations, having to swallow my pride, I emailed him back and said, you know what? I'm really sorry. And I apologize, even though you told me that you forgave me first. And that actually started to um, heal my heart, and it actually allowed me to forgive him. Because you know what? We can't do forgiveness if we keep score. Who's more wrong and who's not? And so, even yesterday, I apologized to two former students of mine after having a conversation with one of um, their friends uh, who, who left our church. And to be honest, they're, con I mean, they're having their own narrative, and it's like everybody else's fault but their own. And I know how they conducted themselves, and honestly, it wasn't very upstanding. But then I did message them, and I simply told them, hey, if I contributed to any of your hurt, that you received while you were at church, like I sincerely apologize and I just ask, I, I said, please forgive me. Again, because I'm accountable to God. And again, because that's what I'm called to be a Christian who forgives and who asks forgiveness. But you know why it's so hard? It's so hard to forgive others. And maybe even harder to humble ourselves to forgive others. And I think it's part of our product of our culture, okay? I mean, we're naturally inclined to selfishness, but we live in like a weird selfie culture, right? Like, some of us, like, all we do is like, <laughs> like, hey, we're obsessed with ourselves. Like, you hear all this talk, right? We... And in social media, we somehow try to project some perfect image of ourselves and like how awesome we are. And, and it's just like people say, oh, I need me time. Oh, I need to work on myself. Like me, 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 me. Maybe some of us came into the sanctuary wondering, how am I going to benefit from this time? Or like, why does a worship you know, team never sing the songs that I like? Why don't we come into the house of God wanting to make much of God himself? In the scriptures, it tells us that spiritual gifts are given for the common good. Why don't we come into church wanting to bless other people and love other people instead? Why does it always have to revolve around me? See, this whacked out selfie culture, it doesn't work well with forgiveness because we're so obsessed with me. So it's hard to forgive others because it's like, well, he did this to me. Like, she did this to me. Or it's hard to humble ourselves to ask someone for forgiveness because it's like, oh, what about that person? Or like, oh, no, like, oh, no, I can't do, no, 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 I can't, you know, like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. 
You know, in the scriptures, it tells us very clearly that when we are baptized, we have died to ourselves. And when we rise out of that water, like we have a new life in Christ. As Apostle Paul says in that famous verse in Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And that's what we need if I am to forgive. Like, I realize in my life, too, like, I need to kill me. Like, I don't need June to assert himself and think of his rights. I've even seen in my own family, when I die to myself, like, my wife thrives. My children thrive. We always need to remember where we came from. Some of us, maybe we're pretty mature in our spiritual walk and whatever, but let's always go back to where we came from, who we used to be, what God rescued us from, delivered us, how much He forgave us, and just how much we've been forgiven. You know, I celebrate teachings on being the son and daughter of God. There is so much depth in this understanding of the spirit of sonship, and it's amazing. The bride of Christ and how glorious the bride is supposed to be. These things are amazing. But sometimes in a self-obsessed culture, I feel like we need to recover a different identity, which is being slaves of Jesus. It's through Apostle Paul's letters in Romans that we know that we are sons and daughters of God. It's through Ephesians we know that we are the bride of Christ. But you know how Paul always introduced himself? The very first verse in all of his letters, right? In Romans it says, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel. It wasn't just him though. Peter said the same thing. Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ, he starts 2 Peter with. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you may be like, wait, let me see my Bible and you'll see the word servant. You know what? That word is much better translated as slave. The Greek word doulos. You know why we use this word servant? It's because of our nation's history with slavery and because that is so offensive, we switch it to servant. And like most of us who grew up in the church, we're cool with servant. Like, okay, I'll serve and so forth. But then when you say slave, it's like, well, wait a minute. I don't want that. He doesn't simply call himself slave. He calls himself a bond slave. And let me explain what that means. Back in the days, right, in those times, uh, there was slavery, but it wasn't quite like the slavery we think of here in the States. It was a lot more humane. Slaves had rights too. But again, you know, how your life was really dependent on your master's character. But having said that, when the slave worked enough, he could earn his freedom. But what a bond slave was, was a bond slave decided, you know what? I really love my master. I really like it in his house. I have everything that I need and want. And so a bond slave was someone who, after he was able to be free, he would decide, you know what, I want to remain in this house as a slave. And so they would pierce the guy's ears to mark that it was a bond slave. And so again, a bond slave was someone who willingly chose slavery. Again, not in the slavery we think of in America, again, but it was a willing servant, willing slave. And so again, when Paul, who knows that he is a son of God, Paul, who knows that he is a bride of Christ, keeps introducing himself as a bond slave, it's because when you are a bond slave, and most people will be like, why would you want that? Well, it's because you need to take a look at my master. Because of who my master is, I choose to be a bond slave. We need to die to ourselves. We need to be bond slaves of Jesus. You know, Bill Bright, who was a founder of uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, right, now called True, amazing man of God, literally hundreds of millions of people coming to Christ through the ministry at CCC, right? He said at one point in his life, his wife, and he used to be materialistic, they were actually very wealthy, even in their 20s, 
and they were living in Hollywood Hills. But they met Jesus, and over the two years, they just fell in love with him, and they decided, you know what? Um, from this day forward, we're going to just be slaves of Jesus. And they literally signed a contract, and they considered nothing their own. And through that faith, God started that ministry at UCLA, and it just became something crazy. And you know, till this day, they say just that surrender, and God could use that. And they're buried up in Glendale in Forest Lawn. And if you go to their tomb, Bill Bright and his wife, Vanette, says, Bill Bright, Vanette Bright, slave of Jesus. I think this is important for us to understand before I make my next point, which is that we are called. Christians are people who are called by God. I know we throw around that word calling, but you have to understand this. Look, not only are we people who have been forgiven, but we receive that call together. It doesn't go one without the other. We are forgiven people Glory, hallelujah, that is what God has done, but he doesn't stop there. He actually calls us after forgiving us. See, people who, you know, there's always these people in the church, right? Like, yeah, I'm a Christian, you know, I'm saved, so I get to go to heaven. But they don't really follow Jesus, right? You still want to live your life. You still want to do whatever you want and enjoy whatever you want but you don't really follow Jesus. And my thing is, like, I just don't feel like you know Jesus very well. Some people, like, they, they're, you know, I hear people in the church talk, you know what would be the best? It's like, you know, like, just live however I want, and in my deathbed, like, I accept Christ. Oh, that would be the best kind of life. And you're like, you're, you're just crazy. You don't know Jesus at all. We're like little children who get our own way, and we're eating like dirt, and we think this is good. You know, when God calls you, he has great things ahead. He has huge God-sized things ahead in your life. That is his calling. It is such a gracious thing. Look, he called Levi the tax collector, and he said, follow me. This guy who was a sinner, a traitor, a failure. And Jesus would tell him, hey, you, follow me. It was an incredibly gracious invitation that he could not help but answer. Or when he called the four fishermen, these unremarkable, uneducated guys, and he told them, follow me, and they left their nests at once and followed him. Again, it's not just about getting a ticket to heaven, but it's like this incredible invitation that we get to participate in the life of Christ. We get to be a part of this incredible calling that God has placed in our lives. So forgiveness is only the very beginning. It's how we start the Christian faith it's not the end at all. There's a whole journey, and I pray that we will be able to be people who want the fullness of what God desires for us, this incredible call that he has placed upon our lives. Let's come back to this forgiveness business a little bit, okay? And I want to just take a look at the life of Joseph, who was used greatly. If we could actually put up that slide, please. Uh, let's go, to, yeah, okay. Now, again, put yourself in his shoes. Most of us have siblings here, right? Actually think and imagine for a moment, your siblings sold you to slavery. I know we kind of laugh because it's got, no, no, but really put yourself, would you, able to, would you ever be able to forgive your brother or sister? They were going to kill you, but they decided to be nice and sell you as a slave. You got sold as a slave. I don't know. But for me, every day of hardship and toil, I would be thinking, I want to slap my brother. But Joseph didn't let unforgiveness hinder God's purpose for him. 
because he started to see God's hand. Now, you know, what does Joseph do after he gets sold into slavery? He becomes the man, right, in Potiphar's house because God allowed him to prosper. And then when Potiphar's wife tried to sleep with him, what did he do? He ran away. He acted honorably before God. He passed that test with flying colors, and how is he rewarded? He gets sold into slavery. And I question myself. I'd love for you to ask yourself that question too. Would we still be able to be faithful to God if our faithfulness to God was rewarded with being sold as a slave? But Joseph was because he understood that God's hand was still upon him. You know, but in these stories, it keeps saying, like, oh, when Joseph was a, you know, was a slave, oh, yeah, God was with him. And then when Joseph is in prison, like, God was with him. I don't know, for me, it's like, you know what, God, if this is what, like, go be with somebody else, you know? Like, God, like, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in prison, I'm, I'm a slave, and, and, and these things. But it says that God was with him, and he prospered. And we need to understand prosperity, not just as riches, but simply that, we are walking with God. We are in God's plans. So something is up. And so we remember, like God was training him, the cupbearer. Remember that whole cupbearer and baker, and Joseph is able to interpret the dreams, and cupbearer gets reestablished, okay? And that was one of the highest positions in the land back then. And Joseph tells him, please remember me. But he forgets. And what was God doing? Well, number one, God was teaching Joseph not to depend on man, but there was something greater ahead. Imagine if the cupbearer did remember Joseph and say, hey, Pharaoh, like he really did nothing wrong. Could you let him go? And maybe Joseph would have just walked out. But then he was in prison for two more years until Pharaoh had a dream that he couldn't interpret. And then the cupbearer remember, oh my gosh, there's this guy who could interpret. And the Pharaoh brings out Joseph. Joseph, of course, interprets a dream. And Pharaoh says, you know what? Why don't you take charge? And he becomes the prime minister of that land. So instead of two years ago just walking out scot-free, he endured a little bit longer. But in God's timing, when Pharaoh had a dream that he needed answered, and here comes Joseph, and finally God restores him. So, brothers and sisters, of course, none of us like hardship, but understand that our difficulties sometimes serve a great purpose in our lives. Joseph understood it this way in saving the people of Egypt. If you could put out that uh, slide uh, for me, please. Thank you. Joseph said to his brothers, after dad dies, and now the brothers are scared that dad dies, and he might do something, right? Because they sold him to slavery. He says, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. So for Joseph, God was always at the forefront. He could forgive his brothers who sold him to slavery because he saw actually that God was behind it. And he saw his life in light of God's will. Some of us, we question God's goodness or existence when we face hardship. Some of us quit easily when we have hardship. But let's remember that God is very much with us in our hardships as he is in our best times. Yes, we are promised a throne in the end, but in this life, we are called to bear the cross. And some of us may have experienced this. You may have received a prophetic word over your life. Some of us may have received something from the Lord directly in prayer. Like, it's like specific words about how God's going to use you, what your destiny looks like. And typically, almost every single one of us, when we hear these words, our reaction is borderline unbelief. You know why? It's not because our hearts are hardened or we, do not, we don't have faith, because it's just that what we hear is so overwhelming. It's like, well, like, 
no way. Like me? Like really, God, you're going to use me that way? Like we could never have dreamed up something so big in our lives. It's just beyond our imagination. But you know, just as Pastor Shine spoke last week about Joseph, look, these dreams, God-given dreams, would not be God-given dreams if you could do it out of your own strength. By their very nature, they're impossible. They're so much bigger than you, which is why sometimes we have a hard time believing it. But you know what? God prepares us for this call, and we need to hang on to His promises. Sometimes that's where we fail, is we don't hold on, and we don't, under, we don't receive the lessons that He's trying to teach us. We just sometimes would rather demand God to make our lives easy instead. Or we're not faithful in the here and now. Because some of it, see, we have to understand, prophecy is so not anything like fortune telling. Some guy receives, oh yeah, you're going to be used like Billy Graham. And he's sitting on the couch watching Netflix and eating potato chips. And nothing's happening. And then he's like, oh, I don't know if God's promise is true. Okay? No. In biblical prophecy, yes, there's future elements to it, but usually people are given a choice. So the Israelites are given by the prophets many times, if you obey God and follow his ways, this is what's going to happen in your land. But if you rebel against him and do not pay attention, this is what's going to happen. So then when we receive prophetic words, it's really important for us to hang on to that and live according to it and be faithful in the here and now. And so that we can prepare ourselves for the future that God has given us. If we see the next slide, we see Moses, who also needed humbling, right? Because, right, his mom was Pharaoh's daughter, so imagine how privileged he was. But God sent him to the desert, and after 40 years in the desert, God says this, So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And this is, I think, a very valid question that almost anyone in his age would have said. Remember, the Pharaoh is the most powerful man on earth at this time, okay? And this is not just like a civilized country with a president. I mean, he's a dictator. If you say something he doesn't like, he'll have you killed. So he's saying, God, who am I to go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And you know what God said? He didn't put any spotlight on Moses. He simply says, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you know what you're going to do? You will worship me. Some of us are so filled with self-doubt, self-angst, hatred, some of these things that are not of the Lord. But let me tell you, it doesn't matter who you are. When God gives us God-sized dreams, the only way we can do it is out of the resources of God. And to rely on him, to stare at him, to draw close to him. So it's like, I don't care if you're unremarkable. I don't care if you look around and you think that person's more anointed or that person's smarter. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter who Moses was whatsoever. It was simply, I will be with you. I'm going to go with you. That's all you need. Again, Selfie culture culture doesn't help us because we keep looking upon ourselves and we see our own flaws and we think we could do things out of our own strength and God is saying, no, no. But I have called you. We were forgiven and receive a calling at the same time. Let's go to the last slide and and I'll wrap this up. And Apostle Paul understood something about his calling too. He's the same guy who said in Acts 20, 24, I consider my life worth nothing to me except to finish the race and fulfill the task that God has given me of preaching the gospel. That's what he said, right? And notice what he says to the Ephesian church. In Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, it doesn't, okay, hear me out. It's not the other way. He doesn't say, make sure your call is great enough for your life. He says, make sure your life is worthy enough 
of the call that God has placed in your life. That every Christian, because they serve a great God, all of us have a great calling. And he's urging the people, make sure your life is worthy enough of the calling that God has placed over you. Then he goes on, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the union of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Hey, make sure your life is worthy enough of what God has placed upon you. But then it doesn't end there, but he's also saying, but make sure you love one another. Sometimes we think of the most mature Christians as the people who pray X number of hours a day and know the Bible this much and so forth. Well, if loving God and loving others is the core, is the greatest commandment, sometimes I think, I know some prayer warriors who are drama queens. They always have conflict with people. I don't think that's a mature believer at all. I mean, again, we're a forgiven people. So let me ask you, brothers and sisters, do we need to ask forgiveness of others today? Even if it's your 1%? Do we need to forgive other people today? And are you letting your unforgiveness hinder you from the dreams that God has placed in your life? Well, I pray that today, in response to this message, if needed, that we will ask God for the strength to forgive certain people in our lives or the humility to go before others and ask for forgiveness yourself. If I could have the worship team come up, please. But remember also that you're a called person, that there is a destiny beyond our wildest imagination what God has in store for us, both in this life and the one to come. So I think it's really important for us to remember both things at once. You've been forgiven, but it doesn't end there. Every person who's been forgiven in Christ has been called. You are forgiven. Remember where you came from. Remember that you are nothing. So let us continue to humble ourselves especially even as we mature in the faith. But not only have we been forgiven and we were once nothing, but now you have been called into God-sized dreams. And then God has an incredible destiny and calling that I pray that you and I would make sure that our lives are worthy enough, worthwhile enough of the calling that God has placed upon each of us. all rise together please